Good evening from a sunny Keswick. Um, we're really missing you being here, but it's been great to hear from you, and especially that from the youngest to the oldest, you've been encouraged this week as you've dug into the hope that we have in Jesus. Yes, thank you so much for joining with us again, and thanks for getting involved. Uh, we have loved seeing your comments and the pictures uh, you've been sending, and keep them coming. We're loving those. Uh, here's a few that we've had again today. Uh, here's Jane and Luke, who say, uh, enjoying virtually Keswick Convention Youth in the Lakes. And here is Ryder and Heather Rogers uh, in their tent in their front room in Dorset, joining virtually Keswick. I wouldn't fancy camping in that, Kaz. Here's uh, Sue and Roger Woods with Rachel Ulmer, saying we're enjoying the virtual Keswick Convention from Northampton. And here are uh, Hannah and Sam tuning in from Iraq to the Hope Hunters this morning. That's fantastic. Well, it's been great to see your pictures and your comments. Uh, let's pray together as we open our evening celebration. Lord God, we thank and praise you for your character, your power and majesty, as well as your love, mercy and grace. We thank you for the good news of your gospel that you so love the world that you sent your one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. We thank you for this real hope and we pray that people would see the hope that we have by the way we live our lives. Help us this evening in our different locations and situations to engage all that we are, our minds and thoughts, our hearts and desires, our emotions and feelings, our will and ambition to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, here's our opening song, an opportunity to praise our God for who he is and what he's done for us. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation.
In the UK, uh, there's 1.5 million adults uh, living with learning disabilities. And Count Everyone In is an organisation that is passionate about sharing with them the love of Jesus. They do this through inspiring and equipping the local church to be welcoming and accessible to all. And a few weeks ago, I caught up with uh, Pete and Christine Windmill to ask them about their work and what they're doing at the convention this year. And after our chat, uh, we've got for you one of my absolute highlights from last year's convention when the Count Everyone In group uh, led us in a song in the main tent. Well, it's a real pleasure to be joined by Pete and Christine Windmill from the Count Everyone In ministry. What have we been doing this week? It's been a great week, and I don't know if you've been listening in to many of the things that Keswick are doing, but Count Everyone In every day at 12 o'clock have been doing just a five minute devotional. And it's based on Psalms, just like the Psalms that you've been looking at here during the week. And we'd really encourage you, if you haven't seen it, go and have a look. Go and see what's on offer. And it may be that you think, actually, I know somebody who could really value uh, look at listening into these and watching what's going on. So check out the, the Count Everyone in YouTube channel. And if you really like it and think, actually, that could help our church too, give us a shout because we'd love to help you to make your mm. church more accessible for the whoever. Pete and Christine, we are so thankful to you for all you're doing. Uh, we're now going to enjoy a really special highlight uh, from the main stage week two last year. Uh, when you and the guys led us in a song uh, with some signs. So uh, thanks for what you're doing. We're going to enjoy that song now. They laid him down 
Oh, that was fantastic. Thank you so much to the Count Everyone in group. Well, it's a fantastic work that they're doing and you can tune in and watch their daily devotion at 12 p.m. each day on the Virtually Keswick Convention website. In a moment, Jonathan Carswell is going to be coming and giving us our book recommendations for this evening. And then we're going to hear a little bit more about the Keswick Ministries teaching and training events. But first, Alana is going to introduce our next song. As Christians, we know that our only hope is in Jesus. He transforms everything. And so we should want to know his character, what he's like, how God operates. 
Andrew Wilson has written one of the best Christian books I have ever read. It's called Incomparable. It looks at 60 characteristics of God. For each one, uh, there are only three or so pages long for each chapter. So it's very manageable, very readable. Some of these books on God's character just, you know, they, they quote the Greek and only reference kind of long, complicated words. This is accessible. It's readable. It's deep. It's rich. It's brilliant. It's called Incomparable, and it's written by Andrew Wilson. Once we get to know who Jesus is and how he transforms our life, we'll want to share that with others. And so Michael Otz has written an evangelistic book called What Kind of Hope, which really explores who Jesus is and how, because of him, we can have hope for the future. We need to know about Jesus ourselves and his character and how that transforms our lives. And as our lives are transformed, we'll be desperate for other people to know about him too. Two books on the hope that Jesus brings as we get to know him, as we put our trust in him. Now, these two together should be £21. You can buy them individually at a special deal. But if you go to tenofthose.com forward slash Keswick, you can get the two for 14 quid. I promise you, these books will change your life and the lives of those that you pass it on to. So get to know who Jesus is and introduce others to him too. Over the last few years, Keswick Ministries has developed an annual programme of teaching and training courses in the beautiful surroundings in the heart of the Lake District. Our vision has developed to extend into all year round ministry. That's the same vision that lies behind the Derwent Project. We're passionate about inspiring and equipping you as disciples of Jesus Christ to love and live for Christ in his world. Our prayer is that these courses will support the work of local churches, encouraging those who come to the convention and other Christians. In the last three years, hundreds have attended and benefited from the courses and workshops. The feedback has been excellent. I really love the opportunity this week to think about what leadership actually is, to have a whole week um, and time away from normal demands, thinking about leadership, but thinking about it especially from what leadership looks like as those who follow Jesus has just felt a real privilege, being reminded that ultimately in our jobs and in our lives, our identity is in Christ and everything flows out of that. Hi, my name's Toby. I attended the Keswick Bible Workshop on the book of Hebrews back in March. And it was a great day, really theologically stretching, uh, really helped me um, to make more sense of passages in Hebrews that I've been scratching my head over before um, and uh, showed me new meanings in other parts of the book of Hebrews that I hadn't seen before as well. But also a really heartwarming day, uh, wonderful to, to see really clearly Jesus as our pioneer, that this, this idea in Hebrews that he is our trailblazer, who's walked the path before us and is getting us to glory. So a great day. Another innovative course we ran this year was online preaching. We set it up in response to the COVID crisis as it became apparent that preachers would find themselves preaching online with no notice, no training and no choice. Communications coach and leader of many preaching communication workshops, Richard Garnett, shared his expertise. I think for most preachers, COVID has come as a huge shock. Uh, if you're used to speaking to people in a room, to have to do it online has been really difficult. The rules of the game have completely changed. So for us to have been able to run three workshops via Zoom, an hour each with a uh, hundred preachers and to be able to give them something really concrete and tangible to be able to help them uh, navigate this time uh, has been really, really rewarding. We're currently finalising another exciting programme for the year ahead, including preaching, pastoral refreshment and engaging with science. And we're already taking bookings for the Emerging Leaders online workshop in October. This is aimed to equip the next generation of leaders in business, charity or the church. 
Are you a young leader who's passionate about living radically for Jesus and making an even greater difference for Christ in the place that he's called you to be, whether that's in the workplace or in a church or a charity? If so, you won't want to miss out on the Emerging Leaders Workshop, a unique online week this October with other emerging leaders from around the country and around the world as we wrestle with how to uh, hear God's word, how to live and become like God's son and how to serve God's mission exactly where he's called us to be. The details for this workshop and the other courses can all be found on the Keswick Ministries website. So we hope this one of these teaching and training courses specifically here for you, whatever your role or situation or ministry. You're passionate to hear God's word, to become like God's son and to serve God's mission. And one of these courses can really help you to be inspired and equipped to do just that. So do sign up on one of Keswick Ministries teaching and training courses. Look forward to seeing you there. As James said, do please go and check out the Keswick Ministries website for more information about all those events. There really are a whole host of really brilliant opportunities uh, for you to take advantage of that run right throughout the year. We're now going to listen to a song by Gareth and Jamie Davis-Jones. It's a song about a day when one day we will see Jesus face to face. Things that are currently hidden will be revealed. So much is hidden Shrouded and concealed Folded in mystery Knowledge incomplete and hold on one day the veil will fall and hold on soon all these things will come and we'll gain our sight. I know nothing can replace No Just in part, then I'll know with all my heart. Strain to see what's indistinct through a mirror darkly. I have glimpsed love. Shrouded and 
concealed And hold on One day the veil will fall And hold on Soon all these things will come And we'll gain our sight as we chase the light Reading the Bible for us uh, this evening is Stephen Eccles. Stephen's a regular at the convention and he attends the Count Everyone In program we were hearing about earlier. Uh, so we asked Stephen, how has coming to the convention helped him to grow in his love for God? Hi, my name is Stephen Eccles. I find the Keswick Convention so encouraging because I am able to be with other believers and, <laughs> and make new friends. I go to the Count Everyone In group. The team really helps me to love God more because they get to know us as individuals and teach the Bible in a way we can easily understand. The sessions are very interactive, so we all have the opportunity to contribute and respond to what we are learning. I love everything we do, games, drama, craft, but I particularly enjoy the singing. The songs always remind me of how good God is, which makes me love him more and more. He fills my heart with joy every day. That's just so encouraging to hear, isn't it? Well, Stephen's going to read for us in a moment, and then Graham Daniels is going to come and speak to us. Graham, also known as Dano by a lot of people, is based at St Andrew the Great Church in Cambridge. He is General Director of Christians in Sport and Director of Cambridge United. So if Dano doesn't bring in a sporting illustration to his talk, I'm going to be disappointed. Um, let's pray as they bring God's word to us. Dear Lord, thank you for the opportunity to hear your word, the Bible, this evening. May you bless us through your Holy Spirit, opening our hearts and minds to what you want to say to us. Help us to be encouraged and challenged to love and live for you more wholeheartedly. In your precious name, amen. Amen. I am now going to read Titus 2, 11 to 14. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. 
Simon was 32 years of age. He'd been a footballer since he was 16. And he thought he'd been a Christian since he was 15. He was a pretty new club. He'd been there a little while and they were on their way to a game on the team bus. And a discussion, unusual in football, began about religion. He jumped in thinking, oh, this is good. I like this conversation. And he jumped in defending the Christian faith. And then, then somebody turned to him and said, hey, Sai, what are you batting for the religious thing for? And he said, because I'm a Christian. And he was really earnest. And somebody laughed at him. But they didn't laugh to make fun of Christianity. It was a w much worse. It hurt. They laughed that he could claim to be a Christian. He said, why? What are you laughing for? And the person said, not the way you live. You can't be a Christian. He was mortified. And here's the thing. He should be mortified according to Titus chapter 2. In chapter 2 and verse 5 of Paul's letter to Titus, he says that people should live in such a way that no one will malign the word of God. People were maligning the word of God because of Steve. Now here's the context. Paul writes to Titus and sends him to the island of Crete because there were a lot of people in Crete who were like Simon. They're not taking the Christian message and turning it into some kind of coherent lifestyle that fits the wonder of the Christian message. And so what Paul asked Titus to do is to go to Crete, teach the truth of Christianity so that it changes lives properly, and to find the right people who he teaches that to, to lead churches. Now, you might say, for goodness sake, what's that going to have to do with me? Well, I think two things. One, if you'd say, I'm a Christian, then in this next few minutes, the question is, are you sure that what you're being taught or teaching aligns to what it looks like to live for Christ in a way that people can't malign the word of God. If you're not a Christian, you're thinking, right, what would it look like for me to be a Christian in such a way that people see Christianity alive and good, not ugly? That's what we're up to. This is about the priority of godliness. At the very start of this letter in chapter one and the first line, Paul drives it home. He says, I want people in Crete to grow in faith by the knowledge of the truth. They want to know the gospel of Jesus in such a way that it leads to godliness. Knowledge of the truth leads to godliness. Coherent. At the beginning of chapter two that we're in today, he says that Titus much t must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. If you teach the truth, the sound doctrine properly, what is the appropriate behavior? It should follow. And I'll tell you what it shouldn't be like. Simon. Simon's all over Crete. Let's fix it. Simon's, I'm in Cambridge, all over Cambridge. Let's fix it. Simon's where you are. All over the place. How do we fix it? That's what we're going to explore. So if the priority of godliness is in Paul's mind here as our first point, let's go to our second point the practice of godliness. What Paul does in chapter 2, verses 2 through 10, is that he highlights five very specific groups of people, older men, younger men, older women, younger women, and people in their workplace. He highlights those people and talks very specifically about what godliness would look like for them. Our focus today has to be on verses 11 to 14, but to get the context of 11 to 14, I do need to highlight the last line of chapter 2, verses 2 to 10. After examples for the lives of all those five constituent parts, Paul writes to Titus right at the end in verse 10, that for these people, these five groups of people, in every way, their lives should make the teaching about God our Saviour attractive. Attractive. And the root word is cosmetic, from which we get the word looking attractive. Now, as you may see, I haven't got any makeup on today. Uh, and so the cosmetics aren't helping me. And obviously, I'm particularly attractive to look at. But listen to my words. Don't worry about my face. Here's the deal. Here's the deal. Paul says the priority is godliness. Titus, go to Crete. 
Find people, teach them that if you teach the Christian message and it doesn't lead to godly lives, there's something wrong with the message. And when you find those people who get it, give them leadership roles. Get the church sorted. And then the second thing we've looked at is the practice of godliness. He gave lists and lists of things that people should look like if Christ lives in them. And in doing it, his summary is that they should make the teaching about God, our Saviour, attractive. The practice of Christian living should translate into a life where people say, I like what I see, I like her standards, I like her ethics, I like her behaviour, I like her manner, I like her ways, I like her selflessness. Simon was so hurt. He was so hurt on that bus. He needed somebody to help him to understand real Christianity. Because if he could understand real Christianity, what the real Christian message was, then he could live a life of godliness. But as we come to our third and longest part of this talk, we've moved from the priority of godliness to the practice of godliness. And now we focus for the rest of the talk on the power of godliness. Because you might be listening to this and saying, hey, hey, whoa, stop right there. There, listen, I fail all the time. I know the Christian message, but if you lived inside me or by my house or next door to me or with me, you'd see all my failures. Hey, it doesn't say the power of perfection. It says the power of godliness. What does it look like to let the Christian message change you from the inside out? That's what we're going to spend the rest of the time looking at. As Titus is ensuring coherence between Christian teaching and lifestyle, I want to take you back to Simon again. Simon's still a coach. He's been in football for 45 years, professional football. If Simon was here now, he'd say, to understand the power of godliness, come with me. Come to the field with me. You may hate sport. Come with me. Come to the court. Come to the field. You need 360 degree vision. What's behind you? What's going on in the back four? What's going on in the defence? What's going on in my own half? What's going on in the attacking half? What can I see? Where's the ball? Where are the people? What's the shape of the game? Only when you can see what's behind, around and up there, up front, then you know where you stand and how to get on with the game. Sorry if you don't like sport. But you can see it, can't you? You can see that picture, can't you? Right. How does the power of godliness work? Three things. Here we go. Here's the first. Verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared. Thank you, Simon. Let's look back. It has appeared that offers salvation to all people. Here's the first of three things that must be taught about Christianity if it is to lead to a life that is transformed by Jesus and is an authentic, godly life, even though we're not perfect. This is how it looks. We say, who has appeared in the past? Who was it? It was Christ who appeared. What did he appear to do to offer salvation to all people? Here's the first of three things. We must know to have the power of God in our lives right now, transforming us. These are the truths. Number one. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died on a cross. And when he died on a cross, he died to take the punishment for my rebellion against God. He died on my behalf. He crashed through the grave. He made me clean. He made me right with God. He paid the price I should pay. He liberated me from my bondage to enmity against God. All this happens at Calvary. That is the foundation of the Christian message. That's the truth that Titus needs to teach in Crete. And that's the truth that I need to teach today and you. And I need to hear it. And it offers salvation. Do you see it in verse 11? To all people. Don't you love it? Not some people. Not some people. Not just the right type of people. All people. Never negotiate for where the grace of God can go. Never negotiate it. Don't think she can't be a Christian. Now, if we can look back to the cross, we've got some bearings that happened in history. God appeared in Christ. 
to do that. Okay, are we back? Thank you, coach. We're back on the field. We're looking which way to go now. Look forwards. Thank you, Paul. Verse 13, look forwards to the perfecting of our salvation. If we look back to the beginning of our salvation at Calvary, we look forward to when it is perfected. When grace in the future, as well as grace in the past, becomes a reality. Let me read verse 13 to you. We wait for the blessed hope. Hope, that's our theme, isn't it, this week? Our hope. How shall we wait for our blessed hope? When we wait for the appearing, there it is again. He's appeared in the past. He appears in the future in person. The appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Jesus is coming back. The Jesus who died, who appeared, lived, died, smashed death on our behalf, sent his spirit to live in us. He'll be back. Now get your shape in life. Now get your bearings in life. Who are you? Where do you come from? Where are you going? This is the revolution that's called the Christian gospel. And once you get to understand this gospel, and once you know the free gift of grace from Jesus Christ and his spirit in your heart, you have a vision for the future. Look at Jesus' vision for our future. Verse 14, our great God and Saviour Jesus Christ, who gave himself to redeem us from all wickedness. When he died on the cross, he saw our wickedness. He paid for our wickedness. He paid the penalty for it. And he said, you're free, man. You're free, woman, man, Welsh. Free, you're free. I freed you from slavery to wickedness. I freed you to live. I live in you now. He gave us a vision of redemption from the slavery of sin. He set us free from those terrible, terrible, selfish, driven, hopeless things that we despair about in ourselves. He comes to live in us and says, there's a better way, son. There's a better way, he says to me. Live it. And so he redeems us from all wickedness. And he can't stop, Paul. Look at 13. And to purify for himself a people that are his very own. You see, he's going to drive it home. Redemption. Rescued from wickedness at Calvary. That's where I've come from. Where am I going? I'm going to be a guy who is totally free from sin. It'll never, ever trouble me when Jesus returns. What a hope is mine. And meanwhile... He wants to purify me. He wants to live in me. He wants my vision to be on that day. And he still doesn't stop, verse 14. He wants to purify for himself a people that are his very own. I'm his. Oh my word. He dies for me. He pays the price. He sets me free. He'll come back. He's at work purifying me. I'm his, he's mine, that's who I am, who are you? I come from there, I'm going there, he lives in me now, that's who I am. And the last clause says, he wants people who are purified and eager to do what is good. Don't sit around saying, I'm a Christian, I believe he died for me, I believe he beat death, I believe his spirit lives in me, I believe I'm going to see him one day. Not enough, not enough, listen to what Paul says, eager to do eager to do what is good change the world that's the brilliant hope of the christian change the world in crete titus in cambridge in the world of sport daniels where's yours change the world by the power of jesus and that's why when you've got a picture of the world what's the gospel what he did what he's going to do when he comes again Right now, verse 12, present grace. Right now, verse 12, it is God's grace that teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age. Right now. If we know the past and we have hope for the future, a certain hope that we will meet Christ and he'll be thrilled with the vision that we worked out in this life, then right now. Can you see how obvious it feels now? No, no to ungodliness. No, no. When I'm confronted with ungodliness, I say, but what has he done? 
I mean, what has he done to rescue me and liberate me? He has given his life for me and he lives in me. What is his plan for when I die or when he comes back? It's that he'll embrace me and say, Graham, good man. I lived in you. My grace purified you. You collaborated. You allowed me to work in you. You were eager to work out the plan I had for you. Hiya, come here, my son. You see, once you look 360 degrees around life like that, you think, I'm saying no. I can't live in such a way that I say, well, I'm a Christian and I don't care. You can't not care. It is the gospel that transforms the life of a human being for the glory of God. It has to work that way once the gospel is crystal clear. Right now, I'm going to choose Christ's way when it really counts. Well, friends, let's draw this in. What we've aimed to look at tonight in the hope of the appearing of Jesus Christ is the priority of godliness. Paul, teach the Cretans, find the leaders of the churches in Crete who will teach clearly that the Christian gospel will lead to a lifestyle, a high caliber lifestyle. And so make sure, Paul, that people in Crete and Cambridge and Keswick, make sure that when you teach the gospel, they can't stop themselves from being attractive, verse 10. It's very hard to malign them, verse 5. If that's the priority, and if the practice works like that, no maligning, godliness that is lovely to observe, the big deal tonight has been, what's the power for that? And the power for godliness is the gospel. That's why at Keswick we teach the gospel, the historic wonderful gospel of Christ as revealed in scripture. We know it saves us and it prepares us for the future and it gives us a vision for life and we are eager to live for Christ and by his power we will say no to ungodliness and yes to the things of Christ. That's who we are. That's what we're for. I can't go without telling you about Simon. He was 32 when he came into the story, wasn't he? Oh, listen, seriously. Lockdown just ended. I've got to tell you a story that took three weeks to unfold, right in the middle of lockdown. Before I tell you it, let me tell you what happened to Simon. He was so despairing that he thought he was a Christian and people laughed at his claim. Such a gap between what even they understood about Christianity and his lifestyle that he tried to think of anyone he knew who was a Christian. And he remembered one guy who had sold him his pension as a young professional footballer. And whenever anyone talked about this guy, they said he was a Christian and he had a high bar and was deeply respected for his integrity and his manner. So he tracked the guy's number and phoned him up and said the story, told him the story. I tried to talk about Christianity. I think I'm a Christian. They laughed because of the way I live. What do I do? And the man said to him, where do you live? I know somebody in your city. I'll introduce you. I'll put you in touch with each other. You two have a chat. He'll explain the Christian gospel to you. At 32 years of age, Simon heard the Christian gospel clearly for the first time in his life, what Christ had done for him, how Christ had paid his penalty, how Christ had liberated him, set him free, how Christ would return for him one day, and what that meant for a vision for life now, to live in a way where Christ was at the centre, transforming his life in football. He says he got converted to Christ in those couple of weeks. Lockdown, week one, whole bunch of professional footballers coming to a Zoom meeting because no one's at work. Many have never met each other, so people are introducing themselves to each other in the call. One young man says this, 
Well, I started getting interested in Christianity when I played for a certain club and the academy manager was called Simon. This was three years ago, says the boy. Simon was a marvellous coach, but more than that, he was an incredible guy. He had the highest professional standards for us and for himself, but he knew, you knew, he oozed integrity. He was a great guy. And somebody said to me, he's a Christian, your coach. I asked Simon about Jesus. Oh, I asked him about Christianity, he says. And he helped me to understand the Christian message. It's changed my life for the last three years. I'm telling you now, I am telling you now, the following week, somebody else joined the call, 20 or 30 boys in, new boys say something about themselves. You know what's coming, don't you? Well, five years ago, I was an apprentice at such and such a club, and the head of the academy was called Simon. Same guy, same story, same vibrancy, same linking of the message of Jesus to the behavior of the Christian. And I'm not exaggerating. I know, I know. Preachers exaggerate, I know. But I'm not exaggerating. It was a hat trick. Perfect for sport. It was a hat trick. The <laughs> third week, a boy comes to the call. And, and he, it was different this time. He says, hiya, hiya. Two or three lads. They said, how's Simon getting on? And I went, no way. Yes way. It was Simon's contact. 25-year-old boy come through the apprenticeship, 16, 17, 18, 20 year old, met Christ because he thought the way Simon carried the gospel was attractive. Isn't it marvellous? In professional football, in the little world I work in, people meet in Christ because the gospel was taught to Simon and he could not stop but live with Christ at the center. And of course, the impact on the world he works in goes on. It goes on and people meet Christ. So what is our hope? Christ alone. Christ alone is our hope. The Christ who died for us and smashed death. The Christ who will return to own us on that final day. The Christ who lives in us right now, right now, Christ lives in us. This is the gospel. This is the great hope and presence and power. And this is what changes the life of a person who knows Christ personally and makes the gospel attractive. What is our hope tonight? Oh, easy. May I know your power to live. Lord, may your godliness flood through me. May the attraction of Jesus who lives in me reach people for himself and give me life today. May it be so, Lord. May it be so, Lord. Amen. May it be so. Uh, thanks, Dano, so much. What an encouraging, uh, powerful, challenging a great word. Uh, thanks, Graham, so much for that. Uh, that's, we just need to hear that, don't we? That, that Christ is at work in us. We're not doing it in our own strength, but there is that call to say no to ungodliness. And may it be so that we are those, that where we are, people all around us, that we would be making the teaching about God, our Saviour, attractive. Graham reminded us we, we don't do it in our own strength. It's Christ in us. And our closing song this evening uh, really picks that up. Uh, in Christ alone, our hope is found. He is our light, our strength, and our song.
for tuning in this evening from near and far what an encouragement for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people there is no one beyond God's reach and it's by his grace and the challenge well let's keep reaching the world for Christ in his power maybe I, I don't know maybe there's someone at home you've watched that this evening and you're thinking I want to have a little bit of what that Welsh fella's got. If that's you, get in touch. Email us via the, the convention or the Keswick Ministries uh, website. We would love to speak to you, to get in touch with you and to help you find out more. Uh, there's lots of ways you can stay in touch via social media, via the website. Uh, you can also sign up to receive uh, newsletters and uh, briefings about events that are coming up throughout the year. So do, do stay in touch, do find out more. And as we close, uh, let me pray for us now. Let's pray. Father, we've just sung uh, those amazing words that no power of hell and no scheme of man can ever pluck us from your hands. So till you return or you call us home, here in the power of Christ we'll stand. And would you help us by your Holy Spirit to do that more and more and more, that we may live lives that make the teaching of God our Saviour attractive to the glory of your great name. Amen. Amen. Thanks again for joining with us. Uh, enjoy your evening. And hey, tomorrow's our last day, so do plan to join us then. We'll hopefully see you tomorrow. <laughs>